for the interdisciplinary study of anti-Semitism. And today, as you know, it's uh, Yom HaShoah, the day that we commemorate the Holocaust and also the people who resisted against the Holocaust. And um, I'm grateful that for, the, for those of you who have come here, and I'm grateful for our two uh, speakers, and we're really honored that they're here. As many of you know, these days, in terms of anti-Semitism, are serious. The, the, there's been left, uh, reports that just came out, actually by the State Department, and also by Tel Aviv University and other organizations, and reports from around the world show that 2009 was one of the most uh, bad years in quotations for uh, anti-Semitic incidents uh, since World War II, since the Shoah. So this is a time when we really, I think, need to take stock, as we do uh, during Pesach, about notions of freedom and taking stock of where we are uh, in the world. And certainly in terms of anti-Semitism, we really need to understand the new forms of anti-Semitism, the modern, contemporary context of anti-Semitism, as we commemorate uh, the Holocaust. And today, as we speak, as uh, many of you know, in Washington, there are representatives from nations from throughout the world meeting today to discuss the question of nuclear arms and uh, the possibility of rogue states or terrorist organizations acquiring uh, weapons of mass destruction, which unfortunately is also perhaps the elephant in the room, or it's, it's certainly in the backdrop of our discussions today as we commemorate the Holocaust. So today we're really fortunate to have two uh, outstanding women who are really, in a sense, uh, leaders in the contemporary fight and struggle against anti-Semitism. And as you'll hear, a person who survived uh, the Shoah, who is also uh, still, in a sense, uh, I don't know how to sum up these words, I heard her speak in Stanford, and you'll see she has a spirit that uh, transcends the, uh, the hatred that we're here to commemorate. The first speaker will be Stella Bengal. She's a survivor from, she was born in Vienna in Austria. And when we met, we were discussing, this is where my mother's father came from. He was from Vienna. She grew up in Vienna and beginning in 1938, at the age of 11, she witnessed the rise of Hitler's regime and the Nazi regime in, in Vienna. And this affected her family and her family's uh, livelihood. Her family's, her father's store was uh, taken over by the Nazi regime. Uh, Stella's father was taken to Dachau, where he was murdered. And her mother was sent to three different concentration camps, including Auschwitz. Mrs. Bengal came to the United States, uh, survived the, the Holocaust, and she arrived in 1940. During the last 20 years and more, she has lectured throughout the country at synagogues, at schools, and in universities throughout the United States, as well as in Europe. And in 2008, she made a, a trip back to Vienna, where she actually addressed the government to discuss her experience um, as an Austrian citizen. And she'll speak to us today about her experience. <coughs> We're also really privileged to have Hannah Rosenthal, who's the ambassador, uh, or the representative of the State Department. To, she's a special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. She's been appointed by the new Obama administration. Um, and we met in Jerusalem at the Global Forum on Anti-Semitism, where she speaks as, uh, she's outspoken and fights against anti-Semitism uh, throughout the world. She, um, she was, before taking this position, the Community Relations uh, Vice President for the Nonprofit Physicians Service and Insurance Corporation in Madison, Wisconsin, which focused on health, health care and policy issues and prevention. She was the executive director for the Chicago Foundation for Women. She was also the executive director for the Jewish Council for Public Affairs and worked on domestic and international policy for the organized Jewish community of North America. From 1992 to 2000, she was with the Clinton administration and she was the Midwest Regional Director of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. And she was active on the Clinton Gore campaign in 92 and again in 96. Um, she was educated at the School of Rabbinical Studies at Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem and in Los Angeles. And she has a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin. So it's really an honor that you're here 
with us as well. So the way it's going to work is Stella Bengala will speak uh, first, and then Ambassador Rosenthal will speak, and then I will come with some short remarks to the end to sum up uh, the debate. So this is going to be. Thank you for coming. I was born in Vienna, Austria, and did the call it the hotbed of Austria, the worst of worst. <coughs> they, they didn't like the Jewish people even before Hitler came in. As, um, if you want to become a doctor, you couldn't get into a medical school unless you had very high marks. There was a man, Theodore Herzl, he went to law school, and after law school he wanted to become a judge. They told him, you cannot become a judge. You are a Jew. Well, he became a journalist and he looked for a country where all the Jewish people could come. And this was the beginning of Israel. He made, a, he looked for a country Israel, that all Jewish people should move to Israel, which was that time Palestine. But he died very young. He was only 45 years old, and he died on heart problems. I lived with my parents, and grandmother in Vienna. He had a business, he was in the fur business, and things, things went very comfortable. We, we went, I went to school and they called me all kinds of names. It was very tough. And teach, nobody, no Jewish teachers were accepted. Well, we lived alone and struggled and did our best. There were synagogues, we went to synagogues, we went to shuls, but I never felt very comfortable. Finally, in 1938, March 14, overnight, Hitler marched in into Vienna, Austria with his army. The next day I went to school, the teacher said, Jewish children, back of the home. So we went back of the home till a bit there will find a building where Jewish children could go to school. Well, we were struggling along. My father was still conducting his business the synagogues were still open, but, but it was not comfortable. I walked on the street and I was beaten up. You had to be very careful. One day I walked the street and there were Nazis with the yet yeah, the brown uniform, the, they call it the SR. And the 
and they had toothbrushes and they hand me a toothbrush to knee down and clean it straight and all the Nazis that stood around and laughed they gave you finish the next one has to clean the straight okay in the meantime my father had they received affidavit to enter the United States, that we all come to the United States. But they gave out numbers. You had to wait for your number. My mother and me were born in Austria, and my father was born in Poland. So we had a higher number to wait because we all went under Polish quota. Well, in the meantime, you, you had to find another country where you have to stay and wait till you're next to go to the United States. But it didn't work out like that. November 10th, 1938, my father took me in the morning to the new school where all Jewish children had to go. But we didn't go every day because there were too many children and they couldn't fit in so many children. So we went every other day to school. Well, on the 10th of November, 1938, my father took me to school and he kissed me goodbye. And that's when I saw him the last time. I didn't know for many things. All of a sudden, when, when my school was finished to go home, my mother picked me up and says, you know what, my, my father was taken away from his business. Two police officers came and took him in the middle and cuffed his hands and took him away where he is, is somewhere on a police station. I let's go home and have lunch. We went home, tried to have lunch. There was a knock on the door. You have to go out of your house. What is so my mother said, what do you mean I have to go out of my house, of our apartment? We need your apartment. You have to go next door to two families together in one apartment. My mother said, I can't do that. I cannot move that fast. We're gonna help you move. Oh, they helped them. The Nazi helped us move. Ah. Oh. So we moved in, and then they want the key from the apartment. You know, my mother said, I don't wanna give you the key, I wanna keep it. If you don't give me the key, we take you to the concentration camp. So we moved in as fast as possible. Gave them the key. They had the apartment for the key. So we were sitting next to our neighbor and they put beds up, even in the kitchen. And didn't know what to do. My father was away. No, 
of the apartment, we don't have an apartment. All of but the Nazi knew where we are. Again, a big bang on the door. What is next? We want to have the key of your business. So my mother said, this is out. I cannot give you the key of the business. I gave you the key of my apartment. If you don't give me the key, you get sent to the concentration camp. Oh, I went down with my mother. We went to my father's business and went up, up fast. I was, I was screaming. Again, a knock on the door. We cannot open the business. Oh, there was a security lock because there were fur coats in there. They didn't know how to handle it. So I went down with my mother to the business and she had to open with the security lock the business and then they took everything out on the street, all the merchandise. They hired, they took down all the shindles, all the names, and hired a truck to go back and forth, back and forth, to, to rip off the names of the, sh of the sh shindles. He had on top shingles and pictures of fur coat. The truck smashed it all up. And I started crying. We have no home, no business, and where is my father? Okay, we slept in the neighbor's house. Then my mother said, you know what? We're going to to the Gestapo. The Gestapo was only like a three-quarter walk. We went to the Gestapo and there was an SS man in black uniform and we asked where are all the men that are picked up today. And the, guy, and the man says, we don't know. Then we took a walk home and we passed a police station and we saw traps, a lot of traps. Oh, there's something going on. They're going to take them to the railroad station to the concentration camp. Okay, we went home and the next morning we went to the Jewish community and my father was very, very active in the Jewish community. There was a big speaker, all the men who were taken to the concentration camp are in Dachau, near Munich. And we're going to send them food packages. And they will write home every two weeks. Well, it was a very, very tough time. Finally, we got a letter from Dachau. My father writes, write us, and he thought he still has his business. And he told my mother, this certain codes belong to certain people, because people had all kinds of repairs and new codes. And 
we go back to him, but we, we couldn't write back to him what happened. So we exchanged every two weeks a letter. And January 20, uh, 1939, that sent us the urn. My father was killed in Dachau. Well, we took the urn and went on the cemetery and opened my grandfather's grave and put the urn in the grave. As we walk along on the cemetery, the Nazi came on the Kristallnacht and they're shooting in the graves. And a lot of graves were demolished. So I had no father anymore. I only saw him last time when he went to school with me. So far, we got uh, food, uh, food packages, and we, we only could buy a certain amount of food. Only after five o'clock, we could go shopping, all the Jewish people. And when Hitler came to Vienna, no Jew was allowed to be on the street. They guarded the street. All of a sudden, I got a letter from the Jewish community there are children transport going. Any USA, England, and Sweden, Norwegian. Now I know my father was very active and helped me. And I put down, I want to go to the USA, New York because I had relatives there. Finally, I got a letter. I'm accepted to go to the United States because I had an affidavit. And even the number was high, but I could go alone with other eight children. Well, that was something nice, but I wasn't too happy because I have to leave my mother and grandmother. Well, I came, I went to the Jewish community, they looked us over, and then we went to the consulate, we saw the doctor. We were about 36 children. After the doctor, I got a letter that I will get the visa, but only nine children came through from 36 children. Well, we, many times we had meetings, how we gonna arrange uh, the trip, and there was a psychologist, and he, he talked with us, and he asked me where, uh, where, I'm, uh, where I'm going to, stay in the United States. And I said, I will stay with my relatives as sister of my father. And they put everything down. Well, it was 
November uh, 1940, uh, no, November 1940, when we got all together and my mother took us to the railroad station and we all nine walked in with suitcases and there was a rabbi the, uh, who organized it and his secretary was our nanny who would come along and take care of us. As we walked in, the rabbi said, children of one side, mothers on the other side, we had no chance to kiss them, kiss us goodbye. They did it purposely, so there is no commotion. We went out um, the railroad station on the platform. That day, parents could, were not allowed to come out on the platform. Only the children who were rejected came out and waved us goodbye. Our first stop with the railroad was Berlin because Vienna was not the capital of Germany. Austria was Germany. And they had to, they put us in a hostel with, with other Jewish people who lost their home. So, we stood in the hospital, but our nanny, our nanny didn't stay with us. She went to a hotel. And as we went out from the train in Berlin Friedrichstraße, there was an area, there were bombs coming down. And we had to stay in a shelter till it was over. They took us to a hostel and the nanny went to a hotel and we nine children went to the hostel and we just had to do what other people do. And even during the night there were air raids and we had to go to the shelter. The youngest was a girl. We had we had to wake her up and carry her down to the shelter because she was sleeping. She was eight years old and, uh, and the oldest one was 15. And I was in the middle, 13. So we went in the shelter and the, we went to different offices and they checked the paper, and then we went to the trains and met our nanny, and our next stop was Paris, and that was the border. And we were very, very afraid of the border. We had to take our suitcases out and the SS was standing there and gave them, uh, looked up the papers, looked in the suitcases, but somehow they took papers away from me and somehow I was my birth certificate I was hiding. I didn't give it to them. Then our next stop, was Spain, and there we stood three days, and the doctor looked us over. Then, in, then the nanny stood with us. Then we had to go to Lisbon and wait ten days till the ship came. We went to a port. We were picked up by the Jewish community of Lisbon and they put us in a boarding house and the nanny went to a hotel. So they gave us the address where we had to come in the evening and have dinner and they gave us some money to have breakfast 
breakfast and lunch and the two oldest ones, Susan and Arthur, about 15 and 60 years old, they had the money and they paid for it. <laughs> so actually for 10 days we were on our own. We didn't see the money. After 10 days, the Jewish community picked us up and we went, we went to the ship, the, S, uh, the ship was a small ship and finally we went, you saw our nanny there, we met her. It was the SS Excampion. Ex so we went into the ship and we were sleeping in the ballroom on mattresses. One side, there were a lot of French uh, children came. And one side the boys, one side the girls. And they spoke French, we talked German. <laughs> How we communicated, I don't know. But uh, it was a very, the sea was very tough and a lot of people got sick. I never, I never went, uh, I never went to the dining room. I just left from fruit and desserts. So we went 10 days till we passed Bermuda somehow and they checked the papers again. And I was supposed to be picked up from relatives. And we arrived in New Jersey, all the ex championship uh, came to New Jersey and as we talked, I know the two children were picked up. So I looked for my relative. There was there. And there was a woman, she introduced herself. Uh, her name was Lady Mapuza and she came from Berlin and she worked for the uh, foster home below. So, and I said to her, I spoke German to her, I said I was supposed to be picked up. I was standing with two suitcases. No, 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 she says. You come with us. I didn't hear anything from your relative. Probably, probably the mail, because my mother wrote a letter to my relative and the foster home, write a letter, and nothing happened. I said, I don't want to go in a home. I'm going to wait till they come. Oh no, she says, Larry Mapuza. I, you go now on the bus and I will take you to Manhattan, to a home. So only two children were picked up, the rest. I was, uh, I was staying in the home a few days and Lady Macuse was coming and I talked to her, I, I, I wanted to see my relative. And then I heard about, we're going to get shipped out of New York. I don't want to be shipped out of New York, I want to stay in New York. Oh, I didn't hear from nobody for a couple of days. And I'm a wandering person. I always
always had my pocketbook with the address of my relative. Finally, I went to the library. In the library, a man came fixing a window, a contractor. And I'm very, very nosy what he's doing. So I went to him, I looked, and he started to talk English to me. I said, no, 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 I don't speak English. Can you speak Jewish, Yiddish? I say, I not fluently, but I can communicate with you. So I communicate with him in Yiddish. And I gave him the address of my family. I made a copy. So he looked at the address and said, you know what? I have friends right in the neighborhood where you relatives live. I will go over and talk to them. Oh, oh, this is really nice. I thanked him. And the next day I was sitting around. All of a sudden the receptionist called me. You know, your family is here. Oh, I was so happy. But I was all knocked out from, from the trip and then I'd see my relative and I said, oh, I'm so happy to see you all. So they told me it will take a few days till you can come to your family. There is a lot of paperwork. Okay, I stood there a few days and then my uncle came and took me to his home and my aunt and my little cousin. Finally, I went to school and took out easy books. I had a teacher who took, uh, spoke a little German so he I taught German with him, and I learned English uh, on the street with children, and I went to high school, and I found out after the war that I don't have a mother anymore, the Jewish community got in touch with me and said my mother and my grandmother was taken to Theresienstadt concentration camp. That's all I knew. I didn't have much hope that this was still alive. Then uh, I, uh, I got I went to school, I went to business school, and I got married, and uh, I, I had a, my daughter, and she grew up to a nice lady, and now I have two grandsons, and I'm a great grandmother. <laughs> It's a 
different generation and, and a different government go. And finally, we were 250 people who got together and I took my sister along. She was my secretary. She wrote everything down. Finally, we arrived in Vienna and they put us in a hotel. But in the meantime, I had a um, student from Innsbruck, that's the ski resort, who took my story and made research about my mother. <coughs> so they came from Innsbruck on a Sunday and I went in touch with them. We all went in touch and I found out that my mother, my grandmother were in three concentration camps in Theretienstadt, in in Auschwitz and in Hofbau, I don't know where it is, I think Germany, and they gave me the exact date when she died. How the Nazi must have kept up everything in the books, I don't understand. Uh, I did a lot of speaking with students and I, I went right to the point with them. I said, you had grandparents. Did your grandparents say anything? How, how Austria was years ago? They said, no, they never talked to us. Well, things were very bad. And uh, there was another group who came from Salzburg and they made reports what happened. So they came back. I had a professor from Innsbruck and Spruck and a professor from Salzburg. And they all made reports. The professor from Vienna sent two students to me to make reports what was going on. So I took them out for lunch and they made a report about my life. They took me to the cemetery where my father, uh, Earl, was buried. I fixed up the grave um, because it was in bad condition. And to calm me down, I took a course on the Danube with my sister-in-law. Then came Friday night, and on Friday night there was one synagogue left that didn't destroy because non-Jewish people lived next to it. So I went Friday night to the synagogue. And believe me, there were trucks and, and policemen with machine guns standing. And I had to show my passport. And in the synagogue, the rabbi spoke English and he welcomed the old children. <laughs> After that, they invited us for a Shabbos dinner, a yeshiva. And, and the uh, there were all kinds of speakers. The rabbi was Hasidic and he was singing songs very beautiful. And there was one day we went to the park.
parliament and we met all the politicians. We met the councillor of Vienna and other politicians. And then they took us outside, they call it the Helgenplatz. There were all chairs for us to sit down on other politicians talk to us and we were protected by police with machine guns and, this, and they apologized what happened. They said, well, it's a new generation. It's a new government. Now, when I went to the synagogue again, we went to a, a cafe, and when I looked around, oh my God, there was city. Judenplatz means Jew Street, and I got the shapes. It's still there. Huh? They have a new generation, and they have a a new government, they still wouldn't pass. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, we went back, we went back uh, to the hotel. The next day I went to, uh, to my building where I used to live. I went to the business where my father uh, had the business and it was all shut down. I couldn't even look down. And I shouldn't, I, it didn't look there. It was all uh, papers. I wanted to go in, it was locked. And then I went back to the hotel. On the end of the trip, they asked us how it was, how we liked it. Well, I had to say my part. I said to them, you know, I love this country is beautiful. It's very beautiful. You could see from the street, the mountains, the day you. But I must tell you, I still have mixed emotion.
for your survival, for your willingness to tell your story, for your smile when you tell parts of it, for your righteous indignation that you still have. And um, I'm really quite humbled to have been sitting here listening to you and to have to follow you. Um, I am an extremely lucky person. In my life, I have been raised with the Holocaust. We share something, Stella. I'm the child of a survivor, and you're a child survivor of people who did not. I was raised in a family from as early as I can remember. We were talking about the Holocaust. My father was a rabbi, and so he had a platform to talk about it in his sermons each week. He had, he had been incarcerated in Buchenwald, um, but um, actually got out, as in many cases, because of the goodness of a Lutheran minister in Heidelberg, Herman Maas, who helped Dad get out with a fake visa and a fake pulpit and a fake paper to come to the United States, uh, because of course we weren't accepting people also in 1940, unless they had a place, unless they had relatives, unless they had a position. Um, and I stand before you as someone, even though I was raised with the stories, and even though I knew how small my family was, my family reunion could fit at this table with an empty chair, even though I had that in my entire consciousness, I never really could fathom what you went through and what my dad went through. And at one point in my life, I thought I understood. You know that thing that happens when you go from teenage to early 20s when you are sure you know it all? <laughs> and I decided I knew everything there was to know, and now I was going to pick apart my father's psychology of survival. And so I confronted him, and I said, Dad, I hear you each Friday night and Saturday talk about compassion, talk about reaching out, of building bridges. How did you come out of this experience as the only survivor in your entire family with any degree of sanity? And how did you deal with the guilt of being the only survivor. And he said to me, Hanullah, I survived to have you. And so he took that guilt off of his shoulder and put it on mine. And I have been motivated with a degree of mishigas and yet unbelievable passion that only my dad could instill in me. And that is why I think I'm the luckiest person, because in my life, at this point in my life, I've been given an opportunity to work with, in government, of a superpower that is dedicated to focusing on eradicating anti-Semitism. And as I was saying to Charles before, all my life I've been an advocate, and that means I'm pushy. And I'm constantly pushing people until my bill is passed, until the law is enforced, until my issue has been reconciled. It's always been on some human rights issue. And now I'm learning a new discipline. I am a diplomat. And it takes a different kind of skill set and a different kind of language. I am now about recognizing the importance of baby steps and the importance of speaking so that somebody can hear me. And that's the new discipline. I'm five months, really four and a half months into the job and I'm still learning it. I come before you as the new special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. I work in the State Department. The position was created in 2004 by Congress. 
and so I'm the second person to hold this job. And the job has been elevated and integrated into the entire workings of the State Department. And what I mean by that is the position is actually moved inside the State Department, right down the hall from Secretary Clinton. I work in a bureau of fabulous professionals, many Foreign Service officers who have lived in many countries and have never, ever been asked before, how are the Jews? How safe did they feel? How secure did they feel? Did you talk to survivors? How's the restitution going? And I feel like just asking those questions to people who are regularly and professionally adept at dealing with diplomacy, asking those important questions is an integral part of my job. By moving my position into the State Department, right down the hall from the Secretary, it has not only elevated my position, but it's integrated it into everything. One of the things that the State Department does, particularly the Bureau that focuses on human rights abuses every year, we issue two reports. One is International Religious Freedom, and the other is the Human Rights Report. It was just released three weeks ago. And it is a gold standard, frankly, for the world, on how we report human rights abuses in 194 countries. And this year, every single one of the countries that we report on were asked to report on incidents of anti-Semitism and the response the government had. We depend on our em embassies around the globe that's their job, to be the United States' eyes and ears. Sometimes they report things. Sometimes I have to ask them about things. But they are being sensitized to the facts that anti-Semitism, unfortunately, is alive, well, and kicking, and sometimes in their neighborhood. And so for the first time, the 2009 human rights reports have embedded in them reports on all the countries and anti-Semitic incidences and responses. And this is, it's not perfect, but it is a huge step forward. Countries all over the world use our human rights reports. Non-governmental organizations around the world use our human rights reports. Other countries use our methodology and some of our reports to report to their constituencies and their governments, what's going on. And so I'm very proud to be embedded right in the State Department, in the nerve center, where strategies are being contemplated and developed, and where policies are being discussed. And I'm allowed to be at the table and ask these very pointed and poignant questions. 2009 was not a good year. As Charles um, indicated, we saw, um, by many reports, the, mo the most incidences in 2009, globally, of anti-Semitism since World War II. It isn't World War II. It isn't 1939. But there were spikes all across the world. We saw spikes in Australia, in France, in Jordan, in Ukraine, in Russia, in South Africa, where there were Jewish communities and where there were not Jewish communities. We saw incidences spike. And it would be improper for me not to point out that the spike in the incidences happened in January, right after the Gaza um, war happened. And the result of that around the world was translated into Jew hatred on the ground. A very, very um, depressing reality. My job is to, in Elie Wiesel's 
words, we have to create sparks in our hearts out of the ashes. And my job is to work within a system and a bureaucracy that has heard huge numbers, six million. The number we all have embedded in our brains that sometimes is just too enormous to translate into reality. And so some of my job is not just to translate the enormity of the Holocaust, but the individual stories that happen today. To translate the experience Stella had and say the motivations that took her father away, the motivations that slaughtered her mother, have not been adequately addressed in this world. And we as a superpower that use our moral authority, that use our laws, that use our diplomacy, and our money, have to be used to also address that reality. So elevating and integrating my position has been my challenge. And how do I do this? My title is really a mouthful. I'm the Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat Antisemitism. The two verbs, very important. Monitoring, I mentioned the reports. But it also means that every single day, unfortunately, I am checking a classified drive at my computer, my BlackBerry, even this morning while I was waiting for the program.